You can't order a poem like you order a taco. Walk up to the counter, say, I'll take two, and expect it to be handed back to you on a shiny plate. Still, I like your spirit. Anyone who says, here's my address, write me a poem, deserves something in reply. So I'll tell a secret instead. Poems hide. In the bottoms of our shoes, they are sleeping. They are the shadows drifting across our ceilings the moment before we wake up. What we have to do is live in a way that lets us find them. Once I knew a man who gave his wife two skunks for a valentine. He couldn't understand why she was crying. I thought they had such beautiful eyes. And he was serious. He was a serious man who lived in a serious way. Nothing was ugly just because the world said so. He really liked those skunks. So he reinvented them as valentines and they became beautiful, at least to him. And the poems that had been hiding in the eyes of skunks for centuries crawled out and curled up at his feet. Maybe if we reinvent whatever our lives give us, we find poems. Check your garage, the odd sock in your drawer, the person you almost like but not quite, and let me know. The story is about love, which begins with Mary Oliver's opening line to her poem, the poem called Messenger. My work is loving the world. I was offered the opportunity to spend a whole year at a nursing home in Wellesley called Elizabeth Seton Residence Nursing Home to create a theater piece, a performance piece of music, art, drama, and dance, it's, oh, the whole thing, with these residents, who, many of whom had Alzheimer's or memory loss issues. And so I spent a day a week from like seven in the morning until about five in the evening just roaming around meeting the individuals and loving them and hearing their stories, bits and pieces of stories. And then I had two visual artists who were with me who helped them co-create art. And so we were creating this wonderful tapestry of their stories. And as I was searching for it, there was, I didn't have the heart of the piece. And there was a woman who was a resident who didn't join us. And she was hard to engage because she spent her day after breakfast and after lunch and after naps, roaming the corridors in her wheelchair. When she was 87 years old at the nursing home, she lost her power of speech. She couldn't say a word. And then at the age of 90, miraculously, she began to speak again. It wasn't because of therapy. She just woke up one morning and she spoke, but she only could say one word. And the word was, I love you, I love you, I love you too. I love you, I love you, I love you too. And she would beam. And so what she did each day was roam the corridors in her wheelchair and get in the path of people coming in her direction. And she'd grab their hand and she'd look at them and say, I love you, I love you, I love you too. And she would not let go until you said something in return. It was wonderful. It was the heart of the peace. And so I spent time just roaming the corridors with her, seeing that, and then she'd pause and she'd look at me. And every day, once, she'd grab my hand and say, I love you, I love you, I love you too. And I would say, thank you. She became the heart of the piece and the title of the play. And it was such a gift. It was such a gift. I was there when she was in her last moments. And the nurses said you could go into her room and she was in her dying stages. And JP was with me. And so she looked up, not much speech coming from her, but she reached out to JP. And I spent about 15 minutes with her while she held JP close to her. And I walked away later feeling really sad at heart. Two days later, I came to Elizabeth Seton to do the rest of my work with the other residents. And I was walking down the corridor, 
And I turned, and there she was. She had revived. And she was still going, <laughs> saying, I love you, I love you, I love you too. So from Janice, we called her the gate of heaven. I offer that to you as well. Go! Oh. 
eyes closed, I listened to my friend Pam describe her dream. I followed her along a strange stone pathway to visit a new baby. But when her dream revealed that she needed to get the right shoes for the trip, I took a sudden sharp turn in a different direction. A song found its way to me, fragments of a lullaby in my mother's voice. Dear little shoes that carry my baby down to the city street. The words were clear in her scratchy, husky voice, although I hadn't heard them for more than 50 years. I followed the song, now on my own dreamlike path, and found more of it, with one correction. Dear little shoes that carry my Molly down to the city street, tell me where did you go today and tell me whom did you meet? The melody felt completely familiar. I could almost smell my mother. But the lullaby shocked me because it was so different from anything else I know about her. Dear little shoes that carry my Molly down to the city street, promise me only you will always bring her back to me. I hadn't remembered my mother ever being like that. Mostly, she was the kind of person who would have meddled in more than one event in the Bad Mother Olympics. <laughs> Extremely moody, she would often say she had rotten luck to have had all these children and no husband to help her. <clears throat> it's true, it would have been a tough row for anyone to hoe being widowed with five children. I wouldn't have been up for the job either. But still, we moved all the time till I was nine when we went to live in an orphanage while she went to New York City to play the piano. By the time we got back together years later, she had turned critical and mean, especially toward me. I still saw her as the tragic heroine though, unfairly challenged by life, and I blamed myself for her not liking me. Even after I moved to Boston as an adult, I would spend hours on the phone begging her to forgive me for some slight she had experienced. But when I had children of my own, everything changed. It was so natural to soothe them, to croon to them, so deeply wired to adore them, so clear that their little minds were precious beyond anything I had imagined. I knew then something basic had been broken in her, that she couldn't love her kids like that. She even resented the time I spent with my babies. Finally, it dawned on me that taking care of her was kind of backward and perverse, in contrast to them, who actually deserve my care. So I continued to listen to her complaints on the phone and to send her money, but I stopped enduring the punishing conversations. I stopped needing her to forgive me for my failings. Of course, I felt guilty. It's really hard to change the habit of suffering in a nutty, neurotic relationship. She's been gone for 10 years now. My memories are a little softened by distance, but my picture of her is clear. She was self-centered, manipulative, and unkind. But now, surprisingly, I've learned that once she was tender and sweet. Once she wanted my little shoes to bring me back to her, even though later she sent me away and didn't like me when I was there. <clears throat> Once, before my father died, before her load became too heavy, she was free to enjoy me. Maybe even when I sang to my little ones and I loved them so easily, it was because I had known a similar, similar tenderness from her once, long ago and long forgotten. Dear little shoes my Molly wears, dear little shoes, my Molly wears. Another Sunday in the park. Someone has started a calliope in the empty field. Children run from all directions. The narrator, having over imbibed at the feast, is still asleep. This will not do. Life is meant to have a shape. However, an artist is creating a large, 
erecting a large easel, so we may be okay, unless it starts raining again. At the party, the candidates stood on raised platforms and pelted each other with ripe tomatoes provided by a blind farmer who wishes to remain anonymous. <laughs> Some of this might indeed be explained by the author if he were awake. It is mistakenly assumed that the children are in no danger because the carousel horses orbit a fixed point. Thank you. From Linjoy Drive. I'm not from Lynn, wish I'd been, but I'm original sin. I lost my way trying to stay in an Eden of my own imagination. I resist pagination, punctuation, any form of stagnation. A broken nation, a trail of tears. I've outgrown my fears. I'm here to stare in the face of evil and say, what do you got, man? Show me a hand. Flip those cards over. Let's see what's shaking. Fracking, causing quaking, high plains baking, fierce storms raking the coast. Are you blind or ignorant or worse? Just don't even care. Don't give a damn about breathing particulate and filled there. And see, I care. I care so much. I drive me crazy. I slip down that slope. I let go of the rope. But then something always happens to give me hope. An elfin smile, a mischievous stare, a sultry look, or a passionate cares and dares me to bear my soul like here. Occupy everything. A kid with a can of pop cutting across a lawn, a park, was jumped, was stopped, was asked, by whose authority do you invade this grass? Traveling on. Trayvon's mama rises up in the dark, grips my shoulders, searches for a spark of her son. I will look in my dream, I dream, but she shrugs away, keening. Trials go on. We used to say a hood and meant a boy who could hurt you bad. A hood is a fine tradition in cloth. You're hooded for knowledge or wizardry. Executioners wear it. Try it on. We cut down our children. We burn them like weeds. We don't want them cutting across our lawn like Trayvon. Trayvon is unbodied. Now no one can touch him or buy him a drink or blow him a kiss. He's lost with the others, cut down like saplings. They're gone. Thank you. I saw your little sister at the picture show. Said you're married to a doctor. And you're living in Rome Heard you're hanging out with Clooney Angelina and Brad By the time she finished talking We were feeling so sad So we went out for a coffee And the truth came out That you got a little baby And you're living at your grandma's house I've been rolling with the Navy But I'm no more yeah, I drank the captain's whiskey, barely made it to the shore. Hey, I heard I made you cry. Feels like tomorrow died when I think about yesterday. Hey, I know I made you cry. Feels like tomorrow died, so I think about yesterday. Well, I finally got to Asia and got a new tattoo. Told my brother it's a geisha, but it's really you. Now I see your little baby, she got a nose like mine. You know if I only knew, you know I'd never leave you behind. Hey, I heard I made you cry. Feels like tomorrow died, so I think about yesterday. Hey, I know I made you cry. Feels like tomorrow died when I think about yesterday. And now I'm living just to live like I'm living in love. Are you living just to live like you're living in love? 
Can we live just like we live when we were living in love, love, love? We you think about it? Hey, I heard I made you cry. Feels like tomorrow died when I think about yesterday. Hey, I know I made you cry. Feels like tomorrow died, so I think about yesterday. I kind of remember the name of it. Something about yesterday. Thanks very much. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? For the sockeye, memory is destiny. Future and past flowing as one, the same continuum, varied tributaries of the same wide ocean. Thus, when seized by the vise of imperative need, as all eventually will be, these fish battle league after league of salted sea to reach the recalled rapids of their native habitat. And there, in the chill, fresh home waters of their infancy, each seeks the sweet, unique scent of its natal stream. Each meticulously designed to breed, to spawn, to die, to return this one and final time. Thank you. Generation Gap. She was born at Woodstock, and her parents never failed to tell the story. Right there in the meadow, in the pouring rain, they say. The years have added thunder, lightning, and a Santa Claus-like hippie handing out cigar-sized joints to celebrate. She never tells anyone. It does nothing for her credibility. She told a college boyfriend once, a musician who would have sucked the blood from her veins to get closer to the 60s. As her parents might say, it freaked her out. <laughs> they still live in a cabin in Vermont. Their compost heap outhouse and scruffy goats embarrass her even when she's alone. And if she brings a friend along, her parents inevitably play the Woodstock album and haul out their dog-eared photographs in which they see rain-drenched, tie-dyed people celebrating freedom, love, and joy. All she sees are pigs in the mud and herself a pink piglet squealing in protest. <laughs> Fresh fallen snow, sparkling wonder, silent celebration. Wind blown, turbulent changes gather together. Blinding blizzard, white deluge, challenging realities. Bridget's Day proclaims movement to Equinox, brightly lit path. Snow softly covers earth, home fires burning bright, love blankets. Long winter shadows hide the little people songs, joyful gifts. Moonbeams kiss bare trees. Ice mirrors blink, endless truth. Snow melts, water flows, impermanence Rains. Happy winter.
fauna, light blankets bare frozen ground, and it begins as if by chance, this rebirth starting anew, provided with tenderness and care for what had once flowed freely, had once more withdrawn. Yet deep within our core, closest to our mother earth, we knew we were not without, and by her breath upon our essence, upon our seeds sown long ago, we open and all senses resound, each warmed, each awakened to this very space we are within. With so much forgotten, once more we wake, each for the other and for ourselves, rising into fruition in all our glorious wonder by the purest, most unconditional love throughout this grand and wonderful garden. Now we warm and share these gifts, each blessed by our own magnificence and growing ever into the light. Thank you. Sweet.